Sometimes I'll see a movie or play a game that's so bad I wish I could unsee it. Now, to be fair, the movie or the game usually isn't offensively bad, and it probably actually had like a pretty cool concept, but maybe the execution was all wrong. So, this speaker is going to show us that there are legit lessons to be learned from media that didn't quite get off the ground. Cam Perry is a narrative designer and writer. They are currently working on expanding a game born out of the GMTK Game Jam, Out of Control, which is a creepy copy pasta where the player talks to an old computer program named Clarity. Cam graduated from Northeastern University with a degree in computer science and game development. Outside of games, Cam also enjoys baking and acrylic painting. So, Let's learn to give bad media a second look with Cam. Hi, today I'm going to be talking about why bad media has better ideas and how this bad media can make you a better game designer. But to start, I want to explain what I mean by bad media. I know that's a very broad term. Um, in this talk, I will be mostly touching on shows, games, and movies. Um, I include more than just games because I think as designers, we can learn a lot about media from outside of games. Um, this talk is also extremely subjective, so you might have your own criteria that's not shown on screen. Um, and a lot of times when I call something bad media, I just really go based on the vibes of the media in question. There are so many factors that go into everything that it's hard to condense them into one slide. And here are some of the vibes in question. Not all of these have I watched streamers or played myself, but going based off of online discussions and what I know from them, they tend to fit the category. Um, I also want to further stress that bad media does not always mean that it's low budget or that it was low effort. Cats was given a 95 million USD budget and we all know how that turned out. And now I quickly want to go over the difference between bad media and problematic media. Problematic media can also be bad, and bad media can also be problematic. Uh, but in general, I want to stray away from problematic media. Bad media is just something fun. It's not hurting a specific group of people intentionally or not. Whereas problematic media is almost always harmful to a specific marginalized group, or it will highlight stereotypes and tropes. Uh, problematic media also tends to have its entire concept or execution of said concept be harmful rather than having maybe some small questionable segments. I also think it's possible for any media to have problem problematic elements without explicitly being considered problematic, like how many still hold issues with the race class systems in D&D or how the Persona series really doesn't handle LGBTQ plus issues all that well, um, even though Persona 5 Royale did fix that one iffy interaction. It is still very important to hold media accountable for its issues though. And here are some examples for the difference between bad and problematic media. On the left under bad, we have Dalal Simulator and Willy's Wonderland. Dalal Simulator is a dumb stocks game. Uh, the, all the gameplay is watching this arrow go across a graph, uh, which can go below zero so you can get paid to buy stocks. Fantastic game. And Willy's Wonderland is a Five Nights at Freddy's-esque movie starring Nicolas Cage, where not one word is spoken by Nicolas Cage. Um, animatronics are trying to murder him, other characters are trying to talk to him, but he just continues about his day, essentially acting like a video game protagonist, just trying to complete his quest, while animatronics and NPCs just tend to annoy him. Uh, highly recommend both. On the other hand, we have Super Seducer and Emily in Paris. Super Seducer is outwardly a parody type game on the harmfulness of pickup artist mentality. You're basically in a like choose your own adventure, making choices about how to talk to women, trying to get their number, all that jazz. Um, some options are normal, um, some are just awful, and the others are uncomfortable. 
And these awful and uncomfortable choices are sometimes taken to this extreme where it feels hopefully very obvious to the player that they are wrong. And then after each choice, the creator will explain why that was right or wrong. And at first glance, it feels like a great game, trying to unteach the harmful behavior of those who follow pickup artist mentality. But then you look into the creator who is a dating coach and how some of these explanations of the wrong choices still end up showing harmful and creepy behavior as funny instead of actually being harmful and creepy. Emily in Paris is a Netflix show um, where a white woman from America goes to Paris um, for, as a job. The only issue is she doesn't speak French, really understand the French culture, or seem to be the best at her job, yet is portrayed to be a very good new thing for this company. Um, and outside of that, there's a lot of stereotypes and issues with how the whole show just portrays French culture. Anyway, let's actually jump into it now. Uh, so if you haven't already guessed, I love bad media. I love to watch it, to play it, to watch streamers play it, the whole nine yards. I have probably seen most January release horror movies and have willingly bought and played $2 all negative review games that I find on Steam. And will, of course, subject them to friends and family and as well as other shows, movies that I know are painful to sit through. I am by no means an expert in the whole thing, but I think I'm qualified enough to talk about this topic. So let's answer the question, what is so special about bad media? So I think lots of things. Uh, from watching a lot and playing a lot of bad media, I have tend to notice a few things that uh, I find enjoyable about them and what others tend to find enjoyable as well. They can make you laugh at the absurdity of it all. You can tell a lot of heart went into it, or if it's just something that is very cool in concept, but extremely poorly executed. They tend to do things that make the viewer think, wow, that's kind of cool how they did that one thing in one scene, and then be appalled by dialogue not 30 seconds after. I think the best bad media will make you want to show it to everyone upon finishing it, because even though something is so awful, Something else about it makes you just want to tell everyone. I think it can be something that also motivates you to do better um, in whatever field you're in. Do Did I absolutely love seeing what bad end a game where if you die in the game, you die for real would throw at me next? Yes. Did it, it then make me want to make a meta horror visual novel that was better? Also yes. Instead of doing that, did I just force some of my good friends to play this video game? Of course I did. But now I'm sure you're just all curious where I'm going with this. Does bad media really have better ideas? Of course, I argue yes, not in every case, but in a lot of them. So y'all can laugh at me later, but I remember seeing the, ba the Bye Bye Man in theaters and actually kind of enjoying it. The acting wasn't great. One of the characters within the movie kind of lost and gained a British accent, depending on which scene we were in. The story was all over the place, and not every scare was super effective. It's objectively just a bad movie. Um, and though, for those who don't know, this is a movie about a monster or ghost or curse, it's really unclear, uh, that causes insanity, hallucinations, and eventually death if you say or think about the phrase, the bye-bye man. A really dumb name for a movie, but honestly, an interesting concept, a curse that you can't escape, and a movie that will probably end in tragedy based on what we know about the curse. And to give credit where credit's due, they were able to make the actors look like they were losing sleep, um, losing touch with reality, and act a bit more realistic than I think some others would act in a situation like this. Um, it also does a, a nice thing of tricking the audience in the same way it tricks the characters in the hallucination scenes, where in some movies you can tell, you're like, oh, this is obviously a hallucination. Why would someone act like that? But in this one, some of the hallucinations, it feels too much like rooted in reality. So you're not actually able to tell when the character's hallucinating, except for after when they're pulled out of it. Um, it also shows the characters physically changing due to the stress as well. On the game side, we have Deadly Prem Premonition. Um, I feel like this game is infamous. It's a game that just has everything happening at all times. It's glitchy and it's 
awkward. And 15 minutes into the game, I've seen one cutscene and I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> but the game at its most basic is you play as the FBI agent York. You're investigating a murder in this open world survival horror game where there's a day-night cycle, characters and stores have their own schedules, you have your own like sleep and food meter, um, you can drive, uh, and I think if you like don't change your clothes or something, the other characters like get mad at you and you lose points. Um, and at first it's just this weird supernatural horror mystery game where a lot of gameplay feels like you're just driving around interviewing people and you're trying to find this killer. But then there's this also third person combat sequence uh, to find evidence in some other dimension. I, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> lots of mechanics and story that fit together very awkwardly. But it almost works. I think if anyone knows anything about this game, when it was announced to come out on Switch, everyone was like, oh my gosh, finally. And it's, I think that says a lot about it, that that many people want to play it on this new console where it's not going to play very well, um, but people still want it all the same. Uh, and the open worldness and character schedule of this game makes it feel more alive and immersive. The combat scenes aren't anything new, but it's less about actual fighting and more about discovering other things. Um, so all these mechanics together or separately, or just normal mechanics we see in games all the time, but together and within the genre, I feel like it's something kind of new, at least at the time. And even though it's poorly done here, it's still a very interesting way to approach a survival horror game. And last example, I promise, is Bandersnatch, which is movie game, interactive movie, whatever you want to call it. Um, but Netflix marketed it as an interactive film. It's essentially a choose your own adventure though. Um, but a young programmer adapting a fantasy book into a game, there's a bunch of different endings, um, but the main focus of the narrative is free will. It was fun, but a bit lackluster. There was obviously one correct choice and all the bad endings just didn't feel conclusive enough to be an ending and more like punishment for making the wrong choice. But still, it's a game that was widely available and easily played to anyone with a Netflix subscription. Something that opened the door for interactive content on Netflix. I think since then, Minecraft Story Mode you can play on there, there's a Bear Grylls interactive show and an interactive comedy special. Um, and Netflix has recently announced their plans to add more gaming content to the to its platform. And I'm not sure if Bandersnatch had a hand in Netflix moving more towards gaming, but it definitely helped despite its mixed reviews. And I could go on and on about the different interesting concepts or what have you for other various media, but we really only have 20 minutes here. But okay, okay, sure Cam, some media might have better ideas, but how does that apply to game design? So I want everyone who's listening to think back to the first big game they made. And now think about the comps and inspirations you had for that game. Most are probably successful things, which, you know, makes sense. If you're looking for a budget, publishers aren't going to give you money if you say you want to make something that's the next Bubsy 3D. However, if you are making a 3D platformer, playing Bubsy 3D might still help you to some extent. Sure, it's buggy and frustrating, but from playing it, you might understand why something is frustrating. Why did that jump feel bad? What about this camera feels off? What about the movements feel frustrating? This could make you rethink some of your mechanics or possibly realize how one of your mechanics may come off to players. Especially in Bubsy 3D's case, since it's an older game, you can look at the development process and the choices the devs made there and how you could make better choices or why said choices they made just didn't pan out. So now I know you're all thinking this, why should I subject myself to playing something like Bubsy 3D to fill up mechanics when I could just play something like uh, Crash Bandicoot? Came out around the same time and is within the same genre. Why bang my head against the wall when something better already exists? I'm gonna make something on par with or better than the good version of it anyway, right? Good versions of 
games or media in general already exist. So why should we analyze things that we know are bad? So here's my hot take of the day. But when you end up looking at the success of others, that is one way that bad media is created. If we only look at the success of games and ignore their failures, we're not really going to learn from them. And I'm not just talking about personal failures necessarily, but more looking at the failures of games or media that exist within the same realm of what you're trying to make. So for example, let's look at Mario Party. There's a lot of them, so pretend I'm talking about the best one. The ones that I've theoretically are found to be the best ones according to a few tier lists and asking friends are the ones that are currently on screen. Uh, for those who haven't played, Mario is a local party game uh, to play with friends. You can choose from a few different boards to play on, different characters to play as, and there are lots of different mini games to play. You earn coins during mini games to buy stars or power ups, and the player with the most stars at the end win. Uh, it's fairly popular, selling a total of a little under 60 million copies total, and some entries have sold better than others. But even at the worst selling series, they were scored around 7 out of 10 by game reviewers. Uh, but taking the Mario IP out of these games, they are competitive, local multiplayer party games to play with friends and family. Anyone can pick it up pretty quickly, and generally the mechanics are pretty easy to figure out at a glance. Design-wise, there's a lot of moving parts uh, with all the different minigames and board designs, but generally it's a bit easier to make since the minigames don't have to interact with each other. There just needs to be a lot of them, and each individual one just needs to be designed well. Right? Uh, an easy genre to slap on any IP or original character, and you can make a semi-instant success. Eh, why not? Well, maybe not. Um, so these two games on screen weren't that great. Both are essentially just Mario Party with a different IP. For both, critics tend to score it lower, and when users scored high, it was mainly due to nostalgia. Both these games came out in 2002, around the same year as Marty Mario Party 4. Uh, both games more or less followed the same format of Mario Party, mini games, power-ups, coins, a board to traverse, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of this criticism was directed at boring or bland level design, ugly characters, specifically in Shrek's case, and lackluster or repetitive mini games. Uh, the repetitiveness was also in terms of multiple games feeling the same and the same game popping up a lot. So here are two games that follow the same pattern, but still wound up not being that great when you take nostalgia out of the question. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say the reason they're not that great is because they were rushed or crash grabs or whatever. And you know, you might be right. I know it was on the same time, what? I think around the same time of release was during the Shrek craze, so I wouldn't be surprised if devs were rushing, rushing or given a short time frame to make that. Although I can't really say the same about Pac-Man. I love Pac-Man just as much as the next person, but I don't think people were really falling over themselves for Pac-Man related things at the time. And even if these two games were just to write off the coattails of Mario Party to make money, that's what we're all trying to do as game developers, make money. And those working on these games still have skill and talent and understand design. It was just in this case, someone saw the base of what made Mario Party successful and ran with it, instead of really understanding what specifically made these two, or those games good. So yeah, I've said a lot in these past 20-ish minutes, uh, but to sum up, bad media is pretty cool. You should look at as many failures as you can so you know how to avoid them. Um, sometimes bad media is just fun to watch, uh, other things. I know a lot of bad media is written off as a punchline or is so frustrating that it's not worth the time, but hopefully the things that I have said have helped you have helped you rethink some things, uh, to look at the salvageable parts and how you can use them or use them to better understand why something had failed and to avoid the pitfall in the future. Either way, thank you for listening. Uh, my Twitter's on the screen. Uh, hope to hear from y'all soon. DM me with questions. I love answering questions. <laughs>